I'm worried about the future of both our undergraduate and graduate students uh, because I don't think we're doing a very good job uh, educating our young people. Uh, and I don't think that what we are doing is sustainable. I think it's unsustainable financially, institutionally, and curricularly. From the side of the students, we all have seen the figures about the increase in, the in, in tuition relative to the CPI over the years. They've always remained abstract to me. So what I did was I decided to calculate actual dollars amounts, taking the cost of a Columbia or Williams education today and projecting it out. And I figured this at about 6% overall cost. Columbia's modeling, I am told, at about 5%. If you, at, if you look at the 2020 to 21, the cost of, you can see how I've, I've divided it up here, but the cost of four years at an institution like this will be roughly $350,000. By the time my older granddaughter is ready for school, 2029 to 2030, it'll be roughly 590,000. And by the time poor little Elsa is ready for school, it'll be roughly $788,000. From the institutional side, let's look, at, let's look at the four categories. Assets are down and they're not going to go up significantly. We haven't completely recovered from the crash of 2008. I don't think we'll ever get back to where we were before that. Liabilities are up, are, are, are up, and a lot of that liability comes from excessive borrowing. During uh, the 1990s and early part of this century, many institutions became involved in a building arms race. Many of the buildings that they built were not for educational purposes, but they were athletic, four-star dorms, recreational centers, and the like, and they borrowed heavily for that. Costs are either fixed or increasing. Right. Um, we all know the measures that we've been asked to, to, to take to cut costs, uh, but it's very, very difficult to cut, to cut enough to make a significant uh, uh, dent in all of this. And income, income takes various forms, obviously, especially at a place like Columbia where we have income from grants and everything. Uh, but with respect to tuition and the like, we sell our product for two-thirds what it costs to produce it. The model for the university that we have really goes back to Immanuel Kant, who published a little essay in 1798 called The Conflict of the Faculties. Uh, he lays out the blueprint for that, uh, for the university, the research university as we've come to know it, in that essay. This is the first paragraph of the essay, and it's an extraordinary paragraph, it seems to me, uh, considering it was published in, 19, in 1798. I've highlighted some of the sections. All, uh, he used the model of mass production. He used the model of division of labor, right, for the setting up of departments and divisions, which I'll talk about more. He, the fundamental principle of, of, of Kantian philosophy is the principle of autonomy. He sets up the university as autonomous vis-a-vis -vis the surrounding world. He sets up departments as autonomous vis-a-vis -vis each other. And as anybody who's tried to manage any, any academic position uh, situation knows, there's nothing more autonomous than, an, than a tenured professor. He set up peer review, scholars passing judgment on, on other scholars. Kant was writing at the time of the transition from church to state. Right? So the university as he designed it was worked out in relationship to the emergence of the modern nation state. That model stays, stays operative uh, all the way down to the, to the present day. But it has interesting implications, it seems. There's a certain logic to it. Uh, and that logic, it seems to me, is something that, now, that we now need to rethink. The way I'm trying to understand this is the place of the university in the larger world and the place uh, and the way in which the changes that have taken place in the, last, in the last half of the 20th century have impacted that world and the university by extension. I think the most important shift that has taken place is not so much the emergence of what people talk about as information society, but the emergence of what I talk about as network culture. The world didn't change when we introduced information processing machines. The world changed when we linked them up. It's created a new infrastructure. We see that infrastructure in the world of finance. We see it in the world of media. It's also operative in the university. And these networks, and I'll talk about this more, have a different operational logic. Right? Uh, and that different operational logic 
calls for a different structure of knowledge, and the different structure of knowledge calls for a different institutional structure, and the different institutional structure calls for a different kind of activity within that structure. We misunderstand the nature of, this, of, 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 of uh, students in higher education today. What we take to be the traditional student, the 18 to 22 year old undergraduate we have in our classes here, here at Columbia or Barnard or wherever, that cohort comprises only 15 to 18 percent of the total number of students in post-secondary education. That means that 80 to 85 percent are what we call non-traditional students. Now, I include everything from, from um, junior college to students in the state systems and the like, uh, but that's a huge, huge number. And for those students who are so-called non-traditional, uh, place-based education is going to become much, much less important as time moves on, right? And especially if half their courses that they've taken as, as high school students have been online courses, right? Uh, so we have to understand that we have a very, very small slice of that pie. Now we can say that we can continue doing what we do. Columbia and Williams are not gonna disappear. But the inequitable distribution of wealth and resources between the have and the have-nots within the educational world is every bit as big as between Wall Street and Main Street. Um, whereas our faculty here teaching a full workload, and we all know there's a lot more to teaching than being in the classroom, but are in the classroom 140 hours a year. At Williams, it's 120 hours a year. There are places at college, at, at state schools and like, where faculty members are teaching nine, 10 courses a year with, with seven or eight preparations, 300 students, and no TAs. One of the difficulties, I think, also is teaching is not adequately respected. And the sad fact is that teaching is nowhere more disdained than at a research university, where status is all too often measured by how little you teach. All right. Research is important, it's vitally important, but so is teaching, and there's an imbalance. We need to restructure our financial model, um, and that will entail very, very significant changes. Some of that I've suggested already with forms of cooperation and collaboration. We can share faculty, we can share students. Some of that will involve outsourcing, right? Um, people don't like to talk about that, but it's going to become increasingly uh, important. Um, not all schools can do all things, right? We're not going to be able to offer all subjects, right? We're not be, going to be able to offer all subjects with personnel, with, with faculty members teaching here. That's where telepresence becomes another uh, option or alternative. Uh, and we're going to have to figure out, as I said, how to cooperate on a, on a global level. We're going to have to reorganize the curriculum in some of the ways that I've tried to suggest. Move away from the, the, uh, uh, the fragmented and siloed to create a, more, a curriculum that is more porous, that allows for more uh, uh, intersection and, and, and collaboration. I think we're going to have to move toward a, a rethinking of certification principles. What do I mean by that? I talked about mass uh, customization. I asked the question as to why all courses are the same length, why it's four years, so on and so forth. Right? It's a model based upon the princi a quantitative principle, that is, a certain length of time or a certain number of courses. What if we shift it from quantitative to qualitative mode of assessment? It's not the number of units you acquire, but the knowledge that you have. It then might take one student two and a half years to get his or her degree and one six years. Right? It has to become more flexible, but we'd have to figure out ways to assess that uh, certification. As I said, we have to reassess the balance between teaching and research. Research remains important, but teaching needs to be taken much more seriously. I think we need to teach more, and I think we need to teach longer uh, because the physical facilities of most institutions are not being adequately optimized at the moment. There's another one I forgot to put in here, and I apologize for that. We have to enable students 
to cultivate new and different kinds of literacies. I think students ought to be able, ought, ought to be able to produce theses in alternative media, whether it be digital, whether it be web, whether it be film and the like, across the board. Right? I think they ought to be able to develop those skills which might enable them to do something other than te do what their faculty members are doing. Unfortunately, this is, this is what a lot, in responding to stuff I write, this is what most academics focus on exclusively. But by putting it at this point, I want you to see that it's, it's, it's part of a much bigger complex, as I see it. We need to abolish tenure and impose mandatory retirement at 70. Tenure makes no sense. Um, it's justified primarily, uh, people justify it primarily in terms of academic freedom. I don't believe that's the case. In my own experience, it certainly has not been the case. I think that what we should do is to move to a, a system of seven-year renewable contracts, which is a review, and the person, person can be renewed, uh, discontinued, uh, or whatever. Why? What's the reason? Again, it's financial, but it's also curricular. Curricularly, it's impossible to know in today's world whether an area of investigation that, is, that now seems important to do is going to be important in five years, let alone in 35 years. You just can't know. So you're making a 30 to 35 year commitment when you're a tenure person. Um, secondly, once, it, once tenure is in place, there's no, current, there's no stick. It's very, very hard to make changes with a tenure, when you have a tenured faculty member in place. So you need a system, it seems to me, that allows for continuity but flexibility. Uh, again, at every level, it seems to me that what we have to do is to try, try to create an institution that can emerge, adapt, and change with the emerging, emerging and, uh, and changing world in which we find ourselves. Mark's book, Crisis on Campus, presents as both a financial argument and an intellectual argument against the status quo. And I think he also presented these arguments today. Um, it actually pre preempts knee-jerk reactions against change. Uh, I think this is very good. But not being a university administrator, I'm speaking more uh, in, uh, you know, as a faculty member, I'm more persuaded by the intellectual argument um, uh, because we cannot pretend that the world has not changed or the digital revolution of network culture uh, isn't here. Now, but if the old uh, Kantian model no, lo no longer fits a global network society, should capitalism be the driving engine on both Wall Street and Campus Walk? Now, so my question for Mark is whether there is a point uh, where uh, his financial argument will come into conflict with his intellectual argument as how higher education should be reimagined and restructured. Would the abolition of tenure uh, solve the problem? Um, here, I think our views diverge, uh, given how serious the problems are. Uh, um, the, the problem of inequality among the universities, uh, the rich and the poor, it's a major, major social problem. Capital is not only financial, it's also intellectual. And there needs to be a redistribution of wealth, not only financially, but I think also intellectually. Now, that's the flip side of another problem that Lydia points to, the whole problem of how you do this within a system that is now strongly capitalist. And, and, um, uh, and, and in which there are going to be, there's going to be decreasing support from the government. 